Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, yes, it's a great pleasure for me to be here and uh, talk about some of our coli work within uh, the ProHealth uh, project. And as you will see, uh, a lot of it was concerning the breeders also and transmission patterns. But just uh, a small background, again, many of you know that the E. coli infections can manifest themselves in many different ways. Uh, we have primarily been interested, again, in first peak mortality and the neonatal uh, infections, but of course, um, E. coli may cause a lot of extraintestinal, primarily, infections in poultry. And the salpingitis peritonitis, of course, is also important from our work and the transmission, as you will see in a minute. And sometimes also coli may in adult birds uh, manifest itself like quite acute uh, septicemia. But again, neonatal uh, infections and uh, the broiler breeders uh, was my, our main interest. Again, this is just background showing you how first week mortality may manifest itself. Uh, and, and many of you probably know just mortality rate and uh, days. This is very high first week mortality, but we see it here and it may be septicemia or navel infections, omphalitis, uh, yolk sac infections, uh, and so on. In the laying birds, uh, well, very often when they start uh, laying, um, we also see the rise in infections, salpingitis, peritonitis. Uh, but as you also will see uh, in a minute, uh, it may continue the coli salpingitis, peritonitis for the whole production period. But it very often starts out uh, at the same time as laying begins. We know very well from uh, la uh, layer uh, birds that e oops, sorry. Oh. We know very well from the layer birds that E. coli uh, is heavily uh, involved in first week mortality, uh, again in these uh, layer birds, either alone or in combination with, with other uh, opportunistic pathogens. Uh, and a previous uh, investigation we did, we saw that E. coli was involved, again, alone or together with other uh, organisms in approximately 60% of uh, the first week uh, mortality. So, of course, we, we do know that, uh, and uh, uh, it's not new as such, but in the ProHealth project, we would like to document and investigate in detail uh, how uh, the... Uh, mortality in the breeders and uh, in the progeny uh, was affected by the E. coli infections. So we followed four broiler parent flocks uh, during the whole production period, uh, examined uh, any mortality, uh, bacteriologically, pathologically, uh, and it's important to say that these flocks were not problem flocks. There were no uh, specific problems in, in these flocks. They were actually considered as uh, well-performing flocks. We investigated newly hatched chicks from each of these flocks. They were swapped in the cloaca at different uh, ages uh, and the bacterial flora uh, analyzed. Causes of first week mortality was uh, determined pathologically and bacteriolo uh, bacteriologically. And the coli obtained were uh, characterized uh, genotypically to see whether we could uh, find any link between the broiler breeders uh, and the broiler flocks. We did, of course, obtain a lot of data from these broiler breeder flocks uh, and, and concerning mortality over the production period. And here you see uh, the top five causes of mortality in these breeders. And here we have the overall, the, the, the total number of birds investigated. And again, the salpingitis peritonitis uh, accounted for approximately one third of the mortality in these breeders. Egg-bound was common, uh, fatty liver, uh, arthritis is not, of course not directly as a cause of mortality, but the birds were weak and it started uh, the whole process, you could say, of mortality. Cannibalism also seen in these boiler beta flocks. And we have the different age uh, periods uh, over the production period. And of course we do have some variation here concerning uh, causes of mortality, but salpingitis, peritonitis is the most common cause of mortality over the entire uh, production period. Uh, 
again, perhaps not that surprising for many of us, but documenting it uh, perhaps was a bit of a surprise how much it actually accounted for, uh, the coal iron fictions. So for the parent birds, 1997 birds were investigated by post-mortem. 55% died from lesions associated with bacterial infections, and E. coli was responsible for 62% of this bacterial uh, mortality. E. coli was the cause of mortality in 85% of the salpingitis peritonitis uh, cases uh, in these breeders. Broilers from the parent flocks, the four flocks, uh, dead during first week, was collected and we performed post-mortem, again, bacteriology. Uh, and uh, we saw, or looked specifically into the uh, age of their parents, uh, 30 and 60 week old par uh, parents. Uh, what you can see here is that first week mortality from these four flocks uh, is not alarmingly high in any of uh, these flocks, but again, if we look to the coli and the um, percentages, uh, we see that uh, both in uh, birds from uh, 30 week old uh, parents and 60 week old parents, it is a very high percentage. So again, at least we document very clearly uh, the magnitude uh, of uh, the problem with the E. coli uh, infections. Again, we were, uh, followed it all the way uh, through the, the, the hatchery uh, and sampled also at the hatchery. And this is just to show you that uh, we use pulse field gel electrophoresis to genetically characterize these isolates. It's widely used to do molecular epidemiology, compare isolates uh, and the chromosome uh, is cut into pieces and run in a gel, and we can compare these patterns. So this is just to show that from the hatchery samples um, and broiler samples, we look, of course, for these identical patterns to say some of these uh, isolates may be transmitted and found uh, from the top of the production pyramid and, and, and downwards. So um, this is the way we have been doing this. In the newly hatched boilers, uh, we can see that, um, well, we have 30-week-old breeders, 60-week-old breeders, uh, and we have also looked at the floor eggs and normal eggs, and this is at the start uh, of, of hatch, minus 24 hours, and this is when they uh, zero, uh, when they leave uh, the hatcher. So we can see that we clearly have a spread and a multiplication of E. coli in the hatcher. We also see that uh, with, for the floor eggs, in this case, they were hatched in, in separate hatches um, and different hatches than, than the, the cleaner eggs, uh, that they are uh, more heavily uh, contaminated with, uh, with coli. So during the hatching process, we see a multiplication and, and spread of uh, E. coli. But the link between the parent birds and the isolates, E. coli isolates from the parents and the broiler isolates, well, we have published that if anyone is interested, and I will go uh, through it uh, briefly here. So, again, we have clusters indicating vert vertical transmission, and of course, this is uh, clusters we see all the way from, uh, from the breeders, salpingitis isolates, in the hatcher, and in uh, broilers dying during first week. So we have some of these clusters from salpingitis, where we see E. coli from salpingitis. We also see it uh, in broilers and uh, at the hatchery. So uh, again, we can document that some of these uh, subtypes of E. coli uh, are transmitted throughout uh, the chain or pyramid, breeders, hatchery, uh, and, and uh, to the broilers uh, in first week. We also characterize these coli isolates uh, in a way where we call them uh, sequence types, where we specifically sequence, where we specifically sequence uh, seven genes in the E. coli and look for similarities. Uh, so this is also a way to, to get a subdivision of the coli isolates. So we have different sequence types 
uh, here uh, in, involved, uh, of course, in this whole transmission as we talked about. What is interesting here is that we see some sequence types uh, more often uh, represented in all three sampling sites. Again, the breeders, the hatcher, uh, and uh, in the first week, uh, broilers. 95 sequence type, as we know in Denmark, has caused a lot of mortality, a lot of problems. It is isolated uh, from all uh, sites more commonly than many of the other. So without going into much detail, we know that some sequence types are more prone to get transmitted from the breeders to the offspring. That's our clear, um, um, I would say, uh, we have a clear indication of that now. There's different ways, of course, to, to show this, uh, these sequence types that some are shared uh, between or seen from, from all these sampling sites. Others are much more common, uh, for instance, in uh, newly hatched chickens or first week mortality, probably indicating that uh, they are from other sources, the environment. We see a much uh, more diverse picture uh, for some of these, uh, or with some of these uh, sequence types. So, conclusion for this study was that, uh, again, uh, very high proportion of the mortality uh, in, the, in the breeders were caused by E. coli and, and Salpingitis peritonitis, you saw that. Uh, also, that E. coli was isolated more frequently from older than younger breeders. Tendency towards a higher prevalence of E. coli in broilers from older breeders. Perhaps not surprising to many of you, but still we document it here. Uh, also, a higher prevalence of E. coli in broilers originating from flow eggs. Higher first week mortality uh, was recorded in broilers originating from older than young breeders. And nearly half of the investigated E. coli strains were transmitted between salpingitis peritonitis affected breeders, uh, the newly hatched chicks at the hatchery, and cases of first week mortality uh, in the broilers. So, uh, some of our conclusions here uh, is that E. coli, as we see this transmission, uh, prophylactic missions should include reduction, if possible, uh, of these disease causing coli in the higher levels of the production pyramid. Trying to tag them, trying to understand which of these apex are more important than others. From a microbiological standpoint, flow X uh, cannot be recommended. I know very well that an economic aspect will say this is not impossible to avoid, but from a microbiological standpoint, surely it cannot be uh, recommended. Uh, also that Future investigations, we conclude, should perhaps uh, look at alternatives uh, to what we uh, normally see within uh, the, the post production and, and antibiotics and so on. And something like probiotics, for instance, used in the hatcher, uh, something we work with in Copenhagen now, uh, using uh, commensals, uh, E. coli. Uh, making them colonize the chick uh, very early and perhaps in that way uh, stop or reducing uh, the colonization with more pathogenic types. Uh, vaccines, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, that in a minute. Of course, uh, we do have coli vaccines, perhaps they're not very good, can be questioned at least. And then uh, some disinfection procedures uh, of the hatching egg uh, must have some emphasis uh, in the future, I think. We looked a little bit uh, on the disinfection of hatching eggs, effect on bacterial load and bacterial diversity. We have published that. Um, it's important to say, perhaps uh, Ilias was optimistic to start out saying that we come up with the, with the optimal disinfection strategy. I will not say we did that, but at least we have shown and, and Previous to our investigations, very little information was available about the effect uh, on disinfection, uh, basically, uh, on the bacterial load and on the composition and the of the microbiome on the surface of the eggshell. And we have looked into that, and, and uh, uh, you should have a, a closer look. Uh, but very much interested in to see how this actually reduced the load uh, in relation to disinfection procedures. 
and what happens with the microbiome on the surface uh, during and after uh, disinfections. Uh, we looked at dirty eggs uh, for the hatchery and clean hatching eggs. The very dirty uh, eggs uh, was, of course, not used uh, as they're not relevant for the production as such. Just a very brief uh, or short overview of our results and showing something about uh, the effect on the bacterial load, uh, number of bacteria on the surface. Uh, if we have the clean eggs and the dirty eggs, you can see significantly higher counts on the dirty eggs, not surprising. But in this case, we're together with our partners from Cyprus, looked at chlorine and one times fumigation, we could see a very uh, significant effect, and they already leveled out these two groups of, of X. A second fumigation didn't actually uh, also much uh, the same level as uh, uh, is, is up here. And after spray, uh, uh, viricide, well, we really get down uh, in, 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 in counts. So this is just to say that <coughs> it definitely has an effect, and now we have a way and a sampling technique where we can actually, in more detail, check different uh, disinfection procedures. We did, as I indicated, also look at the microbiome uh, during this process. And that means that we look at all bacteria, or at least the DNA on the surface of the eggs. Uh, I will not go into detail with this today, because this is a long story, but of course we see an effect uh, on the total microbiome. One thing is, very few people understand the significance of this because it's probably not just an optimal way to sterilize the surface of the eggs. Some bacteria may be beneficial uh, also for the fur further hatching uh, and first week uh, survivability, uh, for instance. But again, we have a measure, and this was the first time we actually, someone looked at the microbiome uh, of the surface of these hatching eggs. So we have a very good tool now uh, to go to look more in detail into this. A lot, I will talk and finalize a little bit about uh, the vaccines. I mentioned the vaccines and E. coli vaccines. And in Denmark, for instance, uh, all our breeders uh, are vaccinated uh, against E. coli. And Basically, basically, also all our layers. The very interesting thing is that the documentation for the effect of this vaccination is uh, not very uh, convincing. And uh, a lot of people say uh, in the field, some veterinarians, it's very good. Uh, no, other people say it has no effect whatsoever. So this is a very interesting uh, thing to go into detail with because a lot of money is used on this. So we looked at the additive protective effect uh, of an autogenous E. coli vaccine in the broiler breeders pre-vaccinated with uh, the pullback vaccine. We would like to do uh, this investigation in uh, breeders not vaccinated with pullback. But again, in Denmark, uh, the producers do not dare. Uh, uh, I mean, they, they want to vaccinate their, their birds with pullback. Uh, so we didn't have any access uh, to birds not vaccinated. So we, we just started to look at, at these autogenous vaccines widely used on top of the pullback to see whether we could see any uh, protection. Uh, and we have a model in Denmark where we, uh, we, we published some years ago where we put the birds down uh, in anesthesia uh, with a mask, isoflurane, and then we make a small incision, dragging out the cell pings out, and we can inject some bacteria. Uh, and then we put it back, and you could see we clamp it, and let the bird uh, wake up, and we leave them uh, for how long time uh, we, we need. It's a nice model, and it works, and it's very easy. We can do four or five animals an hour, so it's to work with. And initially, we did some ink experiment to see whether the flow uh, actually reflected uh, what we would expect, a spread from the cloacal region uh, and uh, cranial uh, and ending up in the peritoneal cavity. And we saw that very clearly. But 
back to the effect of the autogenous vaccines, uh, and again, this, is, this uh, has been published. When you look at it, uh, we have uh, two strains, challenge strains of E. coli, and the auto vaccine uh, is based uh, on one of them. Uh, and uh, of course, we would like to lo look uh, at the other one for some uh, hetero, uh, uh, hetero heterogeneous or cross protection. That's what I what I would like to say uh, of this vaccine. When you look at the results and the birds inoculated again, these birds have not been vaccinated, just challenged, um, and uh, you can see that uh, if they're not uh, vaccinated, well, no one survives with this virulent E. coli, uh, none at all during this seven-week uh, uh, period where we op op make observation on the birds. And then in uh, vaccinated birds, uh, well, uh, we have a quite good survival, uh, most of the birds. So looking at this, one would say, of course, uh, it really works, uh, the autogenous vaccines. Uh, however, things are not uh, that simple because if you look at the same groups and look at the lesion scores uh, when we open up the birds doing post-mortems, again after seven days, seven days post-challenge, we will see more or less the same lesion score. Um, so, and that means the pathology are very similar. What we suspect is happening here is that perhaps the vac uh, vaccine will post postpone the uh, clinical signs and uh, the pathology in developing. So, uh, although it looked very good, we are, we are not convinced ourselves. Uh, and we will definitely go more into detail with this and, and uh, do further studies, uh, challenge studies uh, in these breeders. So it looked as it postponed the clinical uh, uh, signs of, of infection, mortality, was lowest in the group of birds vaccinated twice, followed by the group of birds vaccinated once, whereas 100% mortality was uh, seen in non autogenous vaccinated uh, birds. Again, very nice. But based on the pathology at date seven, uh, we couldn't actually see any uh, difference. They were packed with pus uh, and they would have died. Uh, that's our um, impression. We are convinced, basically. What would have been nice, of course, was that we have observed these birds for a longer time. Uh, but again, the design was not optimal in that respect and we will repeat this. But just to mention to you that we do look into these vaccines and we think it's very important when we talk about coli as a future measure to control or reduce uh, the E. coli problem. And again, we would very much like to be better in predicting which subtypes of E. coli are the worst because there are definitely clear virulence differences in these apex. So with this, I'll just like to acknowledge a lot of people and say thank you. Thanks very much, Jens. Because you were so very well behaved in coffee time and came back in earlier than I anticipated, um, we actually are running ahead of schedule slightly. So, uh, do we have any questions for Jens? Maybe extrapolating the effect you're saying from the broiler breeders to the broilers. So then going back to the grandparents to the parents. Yes. So if it's the first week of the parent's life, so not first week of lay, as you say, but the first week of their life, I have a higher mortality in those chicks who are going to be the broiler breeders. And I look at those for pulse field to see whether the E. coli there in one week of life is then out at 30 and 60 weeks. Did you do that? Does that make sense? Well... We, we follow the mortality during the whole uh, production period. Yeah. So that's, of course, we have samples from 30-week-old uh, birds and 60-week-old birds. But one, one, those birds at one week of age, when they were hatched, those broiler breeders themselves. Oh, the broiler breeders. Yeah. Well, we don't, ha we, we don't have them in the, uh, the grandparents in Denmark. <laughs>
you're that very valid. It could be very interesting to see, but we didn't. We, we, but I would love to. But I would very much also like to check the grandparents. Because, as I told you about, this study is done uh, in flocks with, with no major problems. But in Denmark, 14 and 15, and in the Nordic countries, we had major problems with E. coli. And it was the same subtype in the Nordic countries. So where did that come from? Where do we get our breeder, uh, broiler parents from? So, but but uh, that's another story. On the other hand, Jens, I would say that your, your uh, Venn diagram nicely shows that you only got the same strain in the three levels in a minority of the total number of isolates. And it could be argued that what you're looking at is a prevalent E. coli strain for your environment. Uh, clearly, hatchery can be involved, and I don't think any of us would disagree that there can be vertical transmission. Uh, but I think we, you need a little bit more than just saying this E. coli is in different places to be absolutely sure. But you, you know, we accept that there's vertical transmission of some of these strains, uh, and I think you mo you've moved the, the, the our knowledge of the epidemiology uh, forward by this work? I, I, I would say to that, uh, we have been, I think, very much confirmed later. Because again, the problems we saw in the Nordic countries with ST117, one subtype, 131. Nordic countries, major problems. It was the same clone, we did whole genome sequencing. It was clearly demonstrated. It was the same E. coli in the Nordic countries, and it could only have been originating from one place. And this has been published. So, some types, they do spread and they do cause problems from the top down. Okay, any further questions? Jens, your challenge model for the E. coli autogenous vaccine is quite a severe yeah. challenge model. Uh, when Salmonella vaccine was first licensed, uh, a similar challenge model was used and uh, um, there was still quite a lot of uh, mortality in the Salmonella vaccinated birds. But it was accepted at that time because it was such a severe challenge model the level of difference that you saw made that significant. So you may just want to accept that you, you've still got a lot of E. coli and uh, pathology as a result of that because of your challenge, but it may be that uh, uh, your vaccine with different challenges, not a subcutaneous challenge, may actually be uh, more effective than having a subcutaneous challenge. It was actually in the oviduct, I think, wasn't it, Jens? Yeah, it's in the oviduct. Even we, more, we, we, even we, more we, we infect uh, directly into the oviduct. Um, yeah, it's a model, and, and, and models are always... I mean, we're quite happy with it because I, I, we have published quite a lot on this model, and we can show uh, clear strain variation concerning virulence, we can see, for instance, that broiler breeders are more susceptible to infection in the oviduct than layer birds. And so, so we, we are actually capable of, you know, see different levels. Uh, but uh, obviously, um, again, uh, they survived, the, the, the vaccinated uh, birds, uh, and the other ones didn't. They looked horrible also pathologically. We need to go more into detail with this. We can still fit in one more. Could you take, uh, no, better to, for recording, better. It's basically a short question. Uh, you mentioned probiotics as one yeah. of the solutions. Yeah. Is this a solution to fight the problem or mitigate the problem? It's, uh, we, we see it as a way to reducing the problem. Um, you, you, are, you will never eliminate this problem. Uh, I, I'm, I'm convinced you, you cannot do that. But again, we actually do have some results, preliminary results, showing that, uh, again, 
it, it's, it's old knowledge, you could say, that some commensals, if they colonize very early uh, the chicks, they may be able to prevent more pathogenic types in colonizing and, and creating problems. And this is this approach that we are working with now. Uh, and it's a little bit new, perhaps, because we all know about um, other bacteria, lactobacilli, and so on, used as, as but this, this, this should be coli that we're working with right now, um, trying to, 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 in some way, reduce colonization with more virulent apex. Thank you. I, I think it would be fair to say, just from my own personal experience, at commercial breeder level, um, what we would call competitive exclusion rather than probiotic, uh, is very, very widely used and has become, not because not for salmonella anymore, but for these other organisms. So at commercial level, where, you know... It, the, the, the problem when you, when you use coli for this and not lactobacilli is that we have very difficult, many difficulties in defining an APEC. So you, you, we, we do not want to give a potential pathogen as a probiotics. So, so how to exclude that? That's one of our problems. And ensure a safe product. Yeah. As always, more work to do. <laughs> so thank you very much, Jens. That was very interesting. <laughs>